Hi, I'm Nora Melly, the Education Manager for the Bellevue Center for Horticulture. I am here tonight with Deb Martin, who is going to be talking to us about composting. Um, she is the author of a wonderful book um, that she wrote with Barbara Pleasant called The Complete Compost Gardening Guide. Um, she's a compost enthusiast and also a farmer's market enthusiast. Um, she's here tonight in our second to last uh, food cycle event. Next week is our last one next Tuesday with Stacy Savage, who's going to be talking about um, green business um, and, and reuse and recycling within, uh, re reuse and recycling of food within green business. Um, all of these are done through a grant from DENREC, Delaware Department of uh, Natural Resources. Um, so we thank them for their support. Uh, and without further ado, Deb, I'd like to hand it off to you. All right, thank you, Nora. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. And uh, it's great to talk with you about compost. My name is Deb and uh, as Nora mentioned, I am a compost enthusiast. Uh, I call myself an independent compost advocate. I don't work for big compost or for any of the manufacturers of composting tools or equipment. I just really enjoy compost. And uh, my philosophy is that gardening and composting are the yin and yang, the two sides of the same coin. And I believe that everyone who gardens should also make compost. I once heard a quote attributed to the physicist Niels Bohr saying that an expert is someone who has made every possible mistake in their area of expertise. I don't imagine that I've made every possible mistake, but I've certainly made my fair share and likely will make at least a few more. I got turned on to composting more than 20 years ago when my first assignment as a book editor at Rodale was to oversee an update of their classic, The Rodale Book of Composting. Although I had earned a degree in horticulture from Purdue University, composting was not much in vogue when I was in college. As a result, the subject was fresh to me and I was able to learn from the accumulated wisdom of soil care innovators such as Sir Albert Howard, J.I. Rodale, Ruth Stout, and Grace Kershuni. Working on that book set me on the path of making compost and making mistakes. Right off the bat, I got so excited about composting that I wanted to make compost even though I lived in an apartment and didn't even have a garden. So I started accumulating ingredients in a plastic Ziploc bag in my laundry room. I even boasted about doing this to a reporter from USA Today. This was especially difficult for my mom. She was a retired home economics teacher and her daughter was quoted in USA Today, but it was about keeping a bag of rotting garbage on a shelf over the washer. I'm pretty sure she was equal parts proud and horrified. I can tell you that it's possible to make compost that way, but it's not easy and it's not really a good product when you're done. Since then, I've moved on to bigger spaces, bigger compost projects, and occasionally bigger mistakes. I once tossed into the pile an old towel that had come to the garden as an emergency frost cover, stayed on to wipe off tools throughout the growing season, and was sufficiently soil covered and ratty that I was sure it would dissolve away in no time. But it didn't. Parts of it did break down, but lots of it lingered on in the form of a mass of long, sturdy threads that tangled around every tool I stuck into the heap, making turning the contents a nightmare. That was a lesson that kept on giving. And another time, I collected a load of mixed manure and bedding from a friend who had a few chickens and rabbits. And then I stood and chatted with her while an astonishing horde of flies convened on my treasure through the open windows of my car. Driving home with a car full of flies that have been feasting on manure and then dive bombing your face is a lesson you only want to learn once. This cartoon appeared in the New Yorker magazine around the time Barbara and I were starting to work on the compost gardening guide. It says compost, I say it's manure and I say the hell with it. I keep it because it reminds me that compost is widely misunderstood. Many people confuse it with manure, for example. And while there's nothing wrong with manure, compost is a much more versatile and dynamic compound that may or may not have manure in it. Other people find compost intimidating. They think it's hard to make, or they think that, they, that it requires intensive management, or that it's a failure if it doesn't heat up to 160 degrees. 
So I feel like compost has gotten undeserved bad reputation. That's a shame because compost has so much to offer. It can soothe your soil, not your soul, but your soil, and calm your nerves. You'll feel better about yourself when you make compost in your garden, and your garden will be prettier and more productive. The birds will sing more sweetly and the sun will shine just a little brighter because of your compost making efforts. Really, I promise. In spite of my many composting mistakes, my friend Barbara Pleasant invited me to join her in writing her book about compost gardening based on the idea that composting is a natural part of gardening and that the cycle of growth and decay is best managed when compost projects are integrated into the garden. Instead of tucking compost bins and piles away in a distant corner to be ignored and forgotten, consider creating this brown gold on the spot where it will be used to enrich the future, the so enrich, enrich the soil for future flowers or vegetables. So here are some common misconceptions about compost. Sometimes people are discouraged by, from composting by instructions that insist that a pile must be a certain size. There, you know, there are lots of things that say, it has to be at least three cubic feet, which is pretty big. Or that compost has to be turned frequently, as often as every other day, or even just more often than you really are, want to or are able to. There are ways of making compost that depend upon building ingredients to a certain volume or on turning the pile of material every other day for a stretch of two to three weeks. But there are many paths that can lead to compost success and not all of them require heavy lifting. Traditional composting methods don't always fit easily into modern day routines or into day to today's more compact garden spaces. But that's no excuse for casting your kitchen scraps and garden refuse into the depths of plastic bags and condemning them to landfill limbo. Set aside what you've been told about how compost must be made and consider techniques that mesh with your needs and those of your gardens. You don't even have to have a compost pile to make compost. There are ways to get to the plant nourishing soil building benefits of compost and not all of them start with an enormous heap of decaying organic matter. Home composting, like home gardening, has been shaped by agricultural methods that necessarily function on a much larger scale. But the same processes that turn yards long mounds of farm refuse into rich earthy compost will work to make compost out of more modest amounts of organic wastes. Everything rots after all. And the secret of compost success is to manage the decomposition in a way that fits your time, your needs, your abilities, and, the benef and benefits your garden. The right way to compost is the way that works best for you and for your garden. Now we urge all of you to think about what do you want to achieve by composting? Now, what are your composting goals? This is from the uh, excellent website treehugger.com. Food waste is a major issue around the world as I'm sure people who are here understand. Um, from banana peels to spoiled leftovers, it adds up more quickly than you might think. In fact, the EPA estimates that 42.8 million tons of food waste ended up in landfills or combustion facilities in 2018, which is the most recent year for which we have data. So that's a lot. Yeah, that's a, a reason right there for everybody to be composting. By making compost in your garden, you may hope to recycle nutrients and organic matter back into the soil with the goal of improving soil quality while reducing the amount of fertilizers and soil amendments you have to buy to have, to have a healthy, productive garden. Large scale compost operations are interested in composting as a way of reducing or eliminating waste materials, preventing pollution from entering into soil and groundwater, saving money on waste disposal costs, and cleaning up polluted soil and water. These are extremely worthy goals, and places like Woods End Research Laboratory in Maine and the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania are doing a great service by figuring out ways that waste materials can be removed from the stream of stuff being dumped into landfills or can be kept from leaking into and polluting soil and water and turned into viable soil amendments. But these are not necessarily gardeners goals and the methods they follow are not necessarily practical in a home garden. So these are the concepts behind compost gardening which we consider to be the idea of arranging marriages between compost and garden. The idea of compost gardening is to bring composting and gardening back together. 
The trend has been for compost bins, if people had them at all, to be tucked in some out of the way corner, hidden from sight and barely accessible. Then gardeners would schlep stuff to the compost pile and they'd schlep water to it and they'd schlep tools out to it. And eventually they'd schlep the compost to someplace else in the yard or garden where it was needed. This is an unsatisfactory system to say the least. It's got too much schlepping for one thing, and no relationship between the compost and the gardens it could benefit. So for starters, when you, when you think about composting, choose locations that, are, that save labor. Make composting convenient. Make it in places where you'll eventually use it. Make it in places where you're generating the materials to put into it. Make it in places where you can use it while it's still becoming compost. Stop unnecessary schlepping. Think about what materials you want or need to compost. Where do your compost ingredients originate? How much effort are you willing to invest in getting materials into the compost bin or pile or pit outdoors? Because it's one thing to take a stroll out to the compost bin to empty the day's kitchen scraps on a lovely evening in June and quite another to make that trip on a cold night in January. Even in pleasant weather, daily treks to your compost structure of choice may not always fit your schedule. Most of us need somewhere to stash the day's coffee grounds, tea leaves, broccoli stems, and so forth until we have the time or energy to deliver them to our compost spot. This is my kitchen collection bin, a three gallon container that's lined with a biodegradable bag. It's not perfect, but it works reasonably well. In my two-person household, we tend to fill a bag a week. In the height of summer, when the garden is at peak production, we may fill it more quickly, but I often bypass the collection bin when I'm processing a lot of produce like peaches or tomatoes and take large compost contributions directly to the outdoor bin. So this thing has, let me get my, has a nifty little button. The, the thing I love most about it is it has a nifty little button that you push and it pops the lid open so you can dump things in. And uh, yeah, and it has an, this little liner bag that I would tell you does decompose. They do break down, but not quickly and not if the bin or heap that they go to is too dry. As with all compost ingredients, the more I manage the contents, the more quickly anything that's in there cooks. On the other hand, if the collection bin under the sink gets filled with particularly juicy things when the weather is warm and or the bag doesn't get changed as often as it should, the bag may start decomposing before it gets to the compost bin outdoors. And that's fun. We've learned to put a paper towel or a, la uh, or a layer or two of newspaper under the bag to catch any drips when this happens. From beneath the sink, my bags of kitchen scraps go to the ever trendy little black bin. A loose pile is fine for heaping up yard trimmings, weeds, and garden wastes, but kitchen scraps are better contained to keep them out of the reach of animal pests. When you need something a little more aesthetically pleasing than a loose pile of materials, there's always the little black bin or some you know, variation of it. There are green ones and different shapes, but uh, a friend of mine recently told me that she calls this one the Darth Vader bin. And uh, you can kind of see it does look a little bit like Darth. Popular and widely available, round black plastic compost bins fit tidily into the landscape and work well for breaking down kitchen wastes combined with limited amounts of garden refuse. Different brands may be found depending on where you shop, but most have a locking lid that's on top and a door at the base for removing finished compost. If you're in the market for a little black bin of your own, Look into local agencies such as your county's Cooperative Extension Office or Soil Conservation Service, the Sierra Club, or the Scouts. Often groups give away basic bins as part of compost education programs or sell them at a discount as a fundraiser. Although the LBB is a classic of composting, it is made of plastic and it will deteriorate over time. It might have tended to warp at the seams and become a bit brittle with age. The opening is fine for adding materials, but it's not entirely easy to stir the contents, particularly if one is short and not gifted with great upper body strength. To make up for these disadvantages, I have a nifty compost auger that you can see here. 
uh, that I can twist into the pile and pull out or wiggle around to introduce air into the ingredients and mix things up. You can also use a length of rebar or a sturdy stick to poke into the pile. The goal is to simply let a bit of air in and to mix things together. And here's another, uh, a few more LBB shots. Um, if you're short on dry materials, uh, kitchen, kitchen scraps tend to be really sloppy and wet. And so this just shows, you know, the idea of keeping mix-ins handy and having tools that are available to fit the bin to help you stir things up. So I, I often keep a stockpile of dry leaves next to my bin, or if I'm low on leaves, I will shred up paper and put in there. And this is um, the result of the bin warping. And this is actually just the top section of the bin and the lid that I set into a garden bed to um, stockpile basically compostables over the winter months and then uh, lifted it off and stirred them into the soil from there. Let's see. If stirring is not your thing, you can also plan for passive aeration while adding a bit of dry material to your kitchen scraps. I collect the cardboard tubes from toilet paper and paper towel rolls and insert them into one another until they are dense and sturdy enough to withstand being driven into the compost pile. They serve as little chimneys to admit air and also create shelters for decomposing organisms to dwell in. Eventually they absorb enough moisture and are decomposed themselves and they become part of the glorious mix. If you want something even more contained and tidy than the little black bin, you might consider a tumbler. Tumblers are a popular choice for keeping a tidy and controlled compost cooking. The pros of tumblers are that they have good pest prevention, They're, they allow a, you know, excellent control of the process, and they have a neat appearance. Cons can include the limits on capacity, the need to finish a batch before more can be added, the ease of adding materials, and the ease of emptying and the strength needed to turn the unit. I feel like these have come a long way in the years since I've been uh, involved in composting. They used to be pretty um, bulky and used to have only a single container. But now they, um, this one, for example, has two chambers. So you can put stuff into one and finish a batch while, the other, while you're accumulating materials in the other one. Priced at around $100, these may be a good option for urban and suburban gardeners where pests are a concern. Look for features such as ease of turning, raised height that lets you get a cart under or a container underneath to uh, empty it, and access doors that are durable, easy to open and close, and large enough to accept ingredients easily. A more simple form of compost container is called is a compost pen. And this one is made out of like plastic garden fencing, uh, but you could also make them out of uh, welded wire fencing. And I'll, with a 10 to 12 foot piece of fencing, you can, and a couple of fence posts and some fasteners, you can quickly set up a pen to hold compost materials. A pen is neater than a loose pile, but more open than a bin. Its advantages include ease of construction and inexpensive materials. It's portable and easy to turn because you can simply take the pen apart and move it to a different new location and turn your compostables into that new spot. Um, so it lets you improve a piece of soil and then move the stuff and then make a new you know, good spot. Um, and it's good for storing ingredients for other composts or for making leaf mold. This is a great thing to do with, uh, if you have a lot of leaves in the fall, is to set up a pen and just pack as many leaves as you can and uh, let them kind of just mold down over the winter months. And then by spring, they're ready to be mixed into other compost projects. But if you'd rather keep your compost completely out of sight, you can really keep it on the down low with this little device, which we have called the Pit O Plenty. Uh, this is my friend Barbara's uh, idea. She dug a pit in the soil below her deck, put a sturdy door on top of the pit, attached a rope to this handle, and from her deck then she could actually open the uh, pit up, drop her compostables into it and close it. But the door was heavy enough that it kept animals from getting in there. It kept her dogs from digging in it. So you've probably heard that the medium is the message. And in composting, often the medium is the method. 
what you have to compost may determine how you compost it. So for kitchen scraps with a high degree of animal attraction, a pit of plenty can have a secure lid that will uh, keep, the, keep the critters out. And a, an advantage of this too is, this is the kind of thing where if you are, you have compostables you wanna get rid of, or you want to not put in your garbage can, but you don't necessarily want to manage the compost or have much of anything to do with it, you can use a pit composting situation like this and really never have to do anything more than just put stuff into it and maybe occasionally add um, dry material if it's, if, you know, depending on what you're putting in. And this will just improve the soil. Eventually, you could take the door off and, you know, use the pit space as a garden, or you could just continue to use it that way. Another option for, you know, composting without, whoops, sorry. We're gonna talk about something else first before we move, um, is trenching. If you have not a lot of space for composting, you can build the soil in your vegetable garden one row at a time by making a trench to catch compost ingredients along one side of the bed. Fill the trench over the course of a growing season, covering the contents as you go. And by the following year, you'll have improved soil that's ready for planting in that spot. And there are lots of variations on that that you can do in your vegetable garden. You can create a compost pile at one end of the garden and gradually walk it down the length of the garden as you're turning it. Or, um, you know, you can dedicate like one raised bed to being compost for a year. And if you are trenching, you might consider um, keeping a roll of poultry netting and rolling the poultry netting out over the trench as you fill it with compostables if digging animals are a concern. You can also dig smaller pits and holes for composting in between ornamentals if your garden, if in your garden borders and fill them with a mix of compostables. These will serve as sources of moisture and nutrients for your plants and will gradually build the soil in your beds without a full scale renovation. The beauty of all this below ground de decomposition is that it happens sight unseen but benefits your plants and soils just the same. Composting in pits or trenches is a good method to use in arid conditions too. Gardeners in the Southwest may naturally choose pit composting over pile composting to make the most of moisture resources that are critical to the composting process. As climate change creates drier conditions in this part of the world, we may find that digging down becomes a more viable option for composting than heaping up. But if you're looking for heard of some subcontractors to make compost for you, you might consider a worm bin. This is mine. I call it the worm's turn. And you can let worms do the work for you. With some basic equipment and a small initial investment of time and labor, you can make a simple worm composting bin capable of converting modest amounts of kitchen wastes into compost. And I say modest amounts. This, this bin would not be able to deal with the even the amount of you know waste that we have to put in in my two person household, um, but it takes it will hold, handle a few pounds of food waste every week or so. Commercially available bins are sold by garden supply catalogs and websites, or you can make one from this bin, uh, which is you know use a twelve gallon or larger plastic storage container with a lid. Fill the bin with bedding made of damp and shredded newspaper or dry leaves and about two cups each of garden soil, compost or peat moss and cornmeal. Once the bedding is ready, you populate it with at least 200 red worms. And compared to an outdoor bin, indoor composting with red worms is a slow process, but the worms win during the winter months in temperate climates because they keep working away, even when the temperature outside falls far below freezing. I keep my bin in an unheated basement room and in the winter, it gets down to about 50 degrees in there, but the worms don't mind because they're warm inside their bin. And it produces about 15 to 20 pounds of worm compost every four to six months or so with regular management. Do not collect night crawlers from your garden to populate your worm bin. Go to a bait shop or a sporting goods store that sells fishing equipment and buy red worms that are sold for bait. These are not the foot long specimens you see on the sidewalk following a rain. And they're not those crazy Asian jumping worms either. 
The worms you want for your bin are two to three inch long red worms or red striped worms of the species Isenia fetida and are better for making compost because they normally live in warmer conditions. They're, they're typically manure worms uh, than their larger night crawler cousins. If you start a worm bin, let your worms adjust to their new home for a few days before you start feeding them scraps from your kitchen. The cornmeal that you add to their bedding serves as a starter food while they settle in. Add kitchen scraps, such as coffee grounds, peelings, rinsed eggshells, and bits of bread or pasta up to two to three times a week, burying the material a few inches deep and covering it with bedding. And whether you're having worms indoors or whether you just let the worms be outside, you should always support your local decomposers and worms. Because while we're talking about worms, they do wonderful things to organic matter as they feed on it and pass it through their digestive tracts. Their manure, called castings, is a fine fertilizer for many garden plants. The earthworms you encounter in your garden soil are not the same as those that live in your compost bin. We've already talked about that, sorry. Even outdoors, a bin is too typically warm, is typically too warm for most earthworms. They'll tend to occupy the spaces beneath the bin or in the surrounding soil rather than the pile itself. In the world of decomposers, worms are what I call charismatic macrofauna. They're the obvious workers in the soil and compost. But worms don't do their work alone until countless other known, less known organisms have had their way with the organic material. Molds and fungi, microscopic bacteria and nematodes, and lots of other tiny critters are needed to turn banana peels and watermelon rinds into soil enriching compost. Many of these little guys need liquid to get around. Which is what I wanted you to see in that previous slide. This is why your compost pile needs to be kept moist, but not so soggy that there's no air for aerobic decomposers to breathe. So you see this compost pile has a soaker hose looped through it. And um, that can be really helpful if you have a loose pile or if you're uh, um, composting a lot of yard waste or brushy material because it's hard, it's easy for it to get too dried out. And once that happens, it can be difficult to get it wet enough again. And all those little teeny tiny guys that are busy in there need to um, have some moisture to get around, but not so much that they're drowning in it either. So that's, that's the delicate balance of compost, I guess. So for worms and other decomposers, smaller, smaller particles of material make it easier for them to do their thing. They have teeny tiny mouths. And so the more surface area you expose for them to take their little nibbles with, the better. And this is a, uh, a gadgety thing that I have. Like gardening, composting can be achieved with minimal tools and equipment, or you can go really as gadget happy as you like. And if you've ever looked at a gardening catalog, there's plenty of stuff you can buy, but you don't have to, that's the beauty of it. This is a, a special compost grinder that uh, I received as a gift and it's a, it's a fun thing, but honestly don't use it that much because you know, you gotta clean it out then. Um, anyway, it has a door on top and it has a little you know grinding teeth inside. You put stuff in here and you can see too, this door is only about maybe six inches. So you can't put anything really big in there. This is for you know reducing kitchen scraps basically. But you put stuff in, you turn the crank and it falls down into the store below. And it's just all chopped up and it's kind of nice for when I wanna feed the worms because it makes things smaller for them. Tools for chopping and turning can be quite helpful. A machete is great to have on hand for reducing the size of yard wastes into more readily decomposable pieces. And it's super therapeutic to hack away at a pile of brushy scraps now and then. So, you know, mental health benefits of composting, often underrated, but very important. And grinders like this one are helpful for making food scraps into bits that break down more quickly. But you don't have to invest in a dedicated compost grinding device. This, you can do it without. I mean, you can chop it up with a knife, but you could also shop a yard sale and maybe find a used blender that would serve the same purpose, just 
dedicate a, you know an old blender to the idea of I'm going to throw my compostable stuff in there and um, chop your chop your food scraps up and throw them into your compost pile and uh, you know things will go much more quickly. Or if you have no time for compost tending, no patience for dealing with the messier aspects of kitchen waste composting, and or no outdoor space to do it in, you can consider a really high tech solution. And this is a uh, it's called the Vitamix Food Cycler. And it's a bread machine sized unit that grinds and dehydrates kitchen scraps. At a price of approximately $400, it's not inexpensive, but it appears to do a pretty good job of waste reduction. I haven't used it personally, I just read about it. I think it would be a really cool thing to have, but you know, don't need it. You put vegetable trimmings, coffee grounds, even chicken bones into the collection bucket, which has a capacity of 10 and a half cups. So, you know, you're not doing uh, a huge amount at a time. A cycle takes seven to eight hours and produces fine textured dried material that has minimal odors. This stuff that comes out, despite what they call it, is not compost, but it could be added to compost projects or buried in a pit or a trench in the garden to finish decomposing. Even if you don't want to compost it, a machine like this one does do a fine job of reducing the volume of kitchen scraps into as little as a tenth of their original volume. So, you know, it has some advantages. Most of these things can produce fruit and or can process fruit and vegetable scraps, soft bones, and small amounts of other materials such as pasta or bread. They can't handle fibrous materials such as pits, nuts, watermelon rinds, or pineapple leaves. And they are not really good if you want to have, um, if you're using uh, like the biodegradable bags I showed earlier, um, or obviously pet waste because you. Um, but they, for for what they do, this is this is a cool thing. And in other countries where um, space is at more of a premium, even that it is here, um, these are fairly popular options. And you know, a, a downside too is they are still pretty pricey, and you do need to um, finish the product before you do anything else with before you could safely use it in your garden. You wouldn't necessarily want to take anything right out of this and put it on any of your plants. But low tech works just as well. You can compost without a four hundred dollar machine to grind and your and dry your kitchen scraps. Bins like these, made of pallets. Collection buckets made out of repurposed commercial food containers, turning tools borrowed from the garden. The process can be free and easy and still produce the results you want. A multi-bin system like this one that's made out of used pallets has, lets you have a place to stockpile materials, a bin for cooking, for cooking, and one to move the contents into when you want to turn them for maximum aeration. And it can even have a place to store, you know, finished compost that you are letting cure a little bit longer before you uh, apply it to your garden. The point of composting is to me that the magic is in the mix. Different materials have different nutrients and they invite different decomposers to the table. This diversity of ingredients is another way that home compost differs from large scale models that may have very limited number of ingredients. Many of you are probably familiar with the idea of food miles. The same idea applies to compost miles. Most households and home landscapes produce plenty of materials that can be used to make compost. There should be little need to travel long distances to get things to put in your compost or to buy things that put in, to be put into the bin. Your compost can be almost as omnivorous as you are. And it can also be kind of pretty, I think. Once years ago, my husband and I took a picture of our compost pile and used it as our Christmas card, but we're kind of weird that way. If composting in your home isn't an option, you might consider composting in community. Community gardeners have also been community composting for decades and their model is easily translated to apartment complexes, condominium developments and other neighborhoods where individual space is at a premium. Work with your neighbors and with any governing bodies to establish a centralized location where compost ingredients can be collected and cooperatively managed to make compost that everyone can share. And you can have, even have kind of a pretty 
compost sitting area, I think. Because compost can be beautiful and it can be part of your garden that's not distant or hidden. In fact, the closer your compost is to your garden, the more beautiful it will become because you'll tend it and use it and start to really appreciate all its fine qualities. At the same time, any plants growing around it will benefit from improved soil and better nutrient availability and will be healthier and more productive and more attractive. Members of CSAs, uh, Community Supported Agriculture Groups, may find that the farmers who grow their vegetables and fruits will take back the trimmings to convert into compost on the farm they came from. Ask local growers you buy from, food from if they offer this as part of their services or see if managing such an effort could be your contribution to your own CSA. Increasingly, local governments seeking to reduce the costs associated with waste disposal are adding organic waste to the list of things they either collect curbside or allow residents to deliver to a central processing facility. Because of their bulk, yard waste has long been diverted out of the trash stream and into municipal composting programs. But some towns also collect and compost residential food waste. And I think this is something we could all do a lot more advocacy for to uh, get our uh, municipal bodies to uh, start taking up more of the uh, food wastes and getting them out of the waste stream. Let your own co customized compost methods give you a hand on the road to a healthier, more successful, more sustainable garden. Remember that when it comes to making compost for your garden, your way is the right way. And remember these common sense composting concepts. Make compost where you'll use it. Whether you make a pile or use a bin or bury your materials in a pit, locate your compost projects as close to where you want to use the finished compost as you can. Make it where you can manage it. Likewise, make your compost in a spot that's easy for you to access when you're assembling materials and when you need to moisten or turn them. Out of sight is out of mind. Give microbes, what? Shoot, sorry. <laughs> I just lost my screen. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Give microbes their best shot. Your compost projects will be finished more quickly and produce higher quality compost if you give the decomposing organisms a little help. Keep your compost ingredients as moist as a squeezed out sponge and stir things up now and then to let oxygen into the material. Compost what you have. Most, compo most households produce plenty of compostable material on site. Kitchen scraps, grass clippings, dry leaves, spent garden plants, and weeds Shredded paper or cardboard, twigs, and more all tend to be near at hand. If your own yard is small or non-existent, grab bags of leaves pl placed curbside in the fall in leafier locations. Avoid driving long distances to gather ingredients for composting, and definitely avoid buying material to compost. And choose contents with care. Although organic material eventually decays, some of it takes longer and some of it smells worse along the way. Unless you're carefully managing your compost projects, stick with plant-based ingredients or the manure of herbivores, such as rabbits or sheep. Avoid composting meats, fats, or dairy products, all of which will produce un unpleasant odors and are attractive to pest animals. Compost from municipal facilities can be of excellent quality, but it may contain extra tidbits like plastic waste that were discarded along with the organic materials. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shredded paper makes a good mix in to balance sloppy kitchen waste in your compost projects. <clears throat> and once your shredded documents are coated in coffee grounds and rotting vegetables, there's almost no risk of identity theft. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stockpile autumn leaves close to where you compost kitchen waste so you can easily add a layer of dry ingredients. And remember that a plastic storage container can make a basic bin for your worms. Compost happens, and you should help it along and enjoy the process. I just want to finish with three amazing things that compost can do for you. Compost, this is, this is a big one for me. Compost can save you from yourself. 
In the warm days of late winter and early spring, compost making activities can satisfy the urge to garden without planting too early and losing those plants to late frosts and freezes. This has saved me many a time when I'm like, I must get out and do something in the garden, but it's like way too early to plant anything. Go play with your compost. Give the time for the, you know, the air and the soil to warm up. Compost also boosts self-esteem and alleviates guilt. You don't feel bad about that bag of organic greens that got slimy in the crisper drawer before you got around to eating them. Recycle those nutrients into compost and return them to the soil where they can nourish future garden crops. And finally, as I just mentioned, compost helps prevent identity theft. Once you've shredded those documents and coated them in coffee grounds and rotting vegetation, nobody's gonna try to steal your information. So let it happen, help it along and enjoy it along the way. That was great, Deb. Um, and as I just had my uh, debit card hacked, um, maybe I need to be, I, I don't get paper statements. So it did not come from my, uh, the things I was shredding, but if I ever do again, I should make sure that I do that because that's great. Um, so Judy, we've got a small crowd here and we're just, uh, uh, you know, letting Deb talk. But if you have any questions, um, you can come off of mute or you can type them in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. We are recording as you probably know. Okay. Is there anything you wanna know about composting? Um, actually, and actually I've, I'm, I've worked with it a lot. So I, I do know, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with it, <laughs> but I but the thing I wasn't familiar with is the um, the like the the machines, the kitchen machines that you put in your kitchen, <laughs> that type of thing. I was kind of curious about that. Yeah, I am too. I actually haven't played with them myself. I I desperately want to, but I haven't had that opportunity. But they look kind of neat. If you have four hundred dollars, you want to spend. <laughs> I actually have a service. Uh, maybe you're familiar with it, the Waste Well service Ooh, yeah. um, with Jen Panaro. She she um, she collects your food uh, waste and oh. puts and composts it. I mean, you, you pay her, and she comes once uh, once every two weeks. And um, uh, at the end of the season, like at the in, I guess around May or so, she gives you back one or two bags of compost that, that they've made. It's really neat. Are you, uh, where do you live? Because I, I, we have heard of, you know, there are some of these around, um, but I didn't know, you know, uh, we're based in Wilmington and there's none right now that I know of. I'm in uh, North Wilmington. Um, are you? Okay. Yeah. So and I will have to look into this. Um, is, there was someone I, I think who was um, running this out of Pennsylvania and coming down into Delaware to collect. Is that the same person? I don't think so, but I, I can, um, I'll put my email in the, um, in the chat and you can contact me. I'll give you the information. Great. Thank you. Yeah. The, those, those uh, services are, are really good for people who, um, especially don't have a lot of space like Deb, you were talking about earlier. Yeah. I love um, it. It was also, it's also good because, um, you know, being older, um, I don't really have the strength to haul stuff out and, and turn compost and all that. So it was like a godsend for me. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. The, yes. uh, the city of East and the Eastern farmers market in Pennsylvania has a similar program where um, people can bring their home compostable materials to a central collection point and they're taken by a commercial composter who then uh, makes the compost available at the end of the season for them. So that's really a cool idea, I think. Yeah, I love it. Well, all right. Um, do you, Judy, are there any more questions? Or um, oh, I got your email there. Thank you. This is one of the series, right? Yep. So they are all going to be on our YouTube channel, um, which you can um, get to from our website. Um, we have one more on uh, next Tuesday. And what is that one about? That one, uh, and I'm sorry, the cat's joining us. Um, he's, been, <laughs> he's been whining for a while. Um, that one is with a woman named Stacy Savage, and she's talking about food waste in um, 
and how to sort of as a business recycle it um, and options for businesses, options for people uh, who are entrepreneurs, um, you know, how to work that into a sort of a, a business model that that is helpful. Um, so not as interesting perhaps to the home composter, yeah. but um, she's, she's a great speaker. So might be worth it just for that. Um, what, what is your um, website address? It's the dch.org. Okay. And wh where do I access the YouTubes when I, when I get on there? So um, if you go on to our website and actually You froze up there for a minute, Nora. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, You're right now. <laughs> it's the cat. It's the cat. It's always the cat. Um, all right. So I'm going to, Deb, if you can take your screen share off. Okay. Ready to make the uh, tackle. Hang on. Let me oh. Stop share. There we go. All right. So, and then I'll share my screen. Oh, let's have mine. Oh, I say reversed it. What? Um, bigger. So at the top, Judy, if you can see it at the top here, um, there's a link to, I guess, email us. There's a link to our Facebook, a link to our Instagram. And that is not our, our where is it? <laughs> there it is. Down oh. at the bottom. So on our website, you scroll down to the bottom. There's three, there's Facebook, Instagram, and then um, a link to the YouTube channel. Oh, okay. So um, hey. these will be up there shortly. So I'd be able to watch what I missed from this session. On, on Absolutely. That. Great. Yep. Okay. That's wonderful. Yeah. All right. What, well, I, what I saw looked really great. <laughs> really liked it. Well, Deb is funny. So hey. it's. Um... <laughs> Sorry, there weren't more people. I'm sorry, Judy, I think I cut you off. I was gonna say, I'm sorry there weren't more people that took advantage of it. You know, we, we are seeing this and, and we're hearing it from a lot of other people as well that people do not wanna watch these things uh, live and they'd rather watch the video when it's, when it's released. So we're, uh, you know, going with that. And, uh, and as long as the information gets watched at some point, that's, um, that's right. good, right? Mm -hmm. Are yeah. you laughing at my cat? Yes. Love your cat. <laughs> yes. What's your cat's name? This is Boris. <laughs> Boris or Doris? Boris. B O R I S. -S. <laughs> he Boris. is uh, makes it difficult to work sometimes. And um, yeah. He's very, so he's very cool. affectionate. That's great. Yeah. All right. Um, I think I'm gonna stop the recording now. Laborse. <laughs> <laughs>